Matthew chapter number 18, and look with me in your scripture this morning, if you would, at verse number 23 for the beginning of our reading. The Bible says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Some of his fellow servants saw what was done. They were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after they had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. And this morning I'd like us in our morning message time to study this subject of forgiveness. Now, no doubt in life, we are all going to have an opportunity to say, I'm sorry. No doubt in life, we're all going to have an opportunity to forgive. It's part of human nature. It's part of life. And it is certainly part of being a child of God to give forgiveness to others. I'll never forget a few years ago, our family had the privilege of being at Disneyland for a day. And we were doing some of the various rides and so forth. And we came along that section there where the Haunted Mansion was. And I remember going into that as a kid and, and being a part of that ride. And so we told our kids, you know, it's going to be great. It's going to be fun. And, and uh, let's go do this ride. So we got in line and we began, began making our way there into the building. And, of course, they've got some of the scary stuff out in the yard in front and some of the music playing. And Joseph was quite young at the time. And he kept saying, Dad... I don't think I should ride this ride. And I said, oh, no, Joseph, it's going to be great. I mean, it's all pretend. It's, it's really fun. You're going to love it. It's going to be awesome. And we were kind of having this conversation the whole time through the line, uh, getting up to where it was our turn to go in. And he was very vocal. He didn't want to do it. And I was quite reassuring that everything was going to be fine. It was going to be no problem. Well, we got into the, the room and the walls go up and the lights go out and it was very apparent he was quite scared. And I kept saying, it's all pretend, everything's going to be fine. Finally, we got to the section of the ride where you get on the little car and it begins to take you through the various rooms. And then we got to that room where you kind of overlook and there's a dining room set and there's ghosts and things all around. And the problem was the ride got stuck. And now I am there with Joseph next to me, and the lights are going out. These, these ghosts are flying around uh, the dark sky. <laughs> the, the scary music is playing, and we are stuck there. We're not going anywhere. Uh, I think we were there maybe three, four, five minutes. And he just kept crying and telling me, Dad, I told you it's going to be scary. <laughs> and we finally got off. The, what, I'm sure it was a few minutes, but it felt like an eternity. We finally got off that ride. And we got out the exit. I took Joseph aside and I said, Joseph, I am so sorry, buddy. Uh, I should not have done that, you know. And I built this up and talked him into going, you know. And to this day, he doesn't like the hunting. No, he, he does all right now. But to this day, he doesn't like me. And... Uh, <laughs> And sometimes in life, uh, we, we get ourselves into a spot and forgiveness is needed for sure. Well, we come to a life or to a moment in the life of Christ where he is mentoring his disciples, his followers. And they're uh, here in Capernaum, just on the Sea of Galilee. And there are five discourses in a row where the Lord is mentoring and training his disciples and followers of what it is to be 
a committed follower of Christ and what it is to be a servant and what it is to live your faith out loud, if you will. And this last narrative is just before Jesus is to leave the Galilean region and head down to Judea. And this parable in which we read, while forgiveness was oft taught by the Lord Jesus Christ, this particular parable is only found in Matthew's gospel. And in our text this morning, this parable came as a response to a question that Peter asked. In verse 21, the Bible says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. So Peter was coming to the Lord and saying, How many times do I have to forgive somebody for the same thing? Uh, if they keep offending me and I forgive them, how long does that have to go? When, when have I reached the limit where now I can get even or be bitter or whatever? And the Lord was teaching his disciples that that limit did not exist, that we were to live ready to forgive. And no doubt we can identify with Peter. Lord, where's the limit of this thing? <laughs> Uh, when do I no longer have to be Christ-like? When do I no longer have to turn the cheek? When do I no longer have to respond in the Spirit? When, when can I get mine? The Lord was teaching them an important lesson as it pertained to dealing with people, and mainly that God's ways are not our ways. And that if we're filled with the Spirit of God and living in the Spirit, that we're going to respond to life very differently. Now, this was one of the most important lessons that he was going to leave with his disciples in a few days. He would be accosted in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he would give his life on Mount Calvary, and he would be ascended to prepare a place for us. And before all of that was set in motion, this was one of the key lessons he had to teach his disciples before he left. And you see, it's a key lesson for you and I as well, because it is something that all of us will do. Not everybody's going to sing in that choir. I would love to do it, but everybody else would quit the choir. Uh, not everybody's going to uh, preach a message. Not everybody's going to do this or that or the other. But all of us will have an opportunity to forgive. And it's not our nature. We don't necessarily like to do it. Uh, some of us, uh, we're, we're not good at it. But God wants us to understand it from his word so that we can be more like him. And so in this passage, the Lord paints a clear picture of exactly what forgiveness is and how we can bestow it upon others as well. Let's dive into that and study from this text this morning. And notice with me, first of all, from our passage, the participants of this story, the participants of this parable on forgiveness. And there were three main characters that we read about as we read this passage. First of all, notice with me, letter A, the offended party. Now remember that the king was reckoning his servants. He was taking account of their standing, their status. And he reckons in verse 24 that one of, him, one of his servants owed him a lot of money. And so that servant was brought before him so that they could figure out how that was going to be paid. And then that servant, after that conversation, goes and finds a servant who owes him money. And so you have the offended party. And in this parable, those who were wronged or offended was equivalent to someone owed them money, owed them a debt. Um, there may be someone that owes you money right now. And uh, try not to think about that during this message. All right, we want to learn about uh, forgiveness. And so... Their debt was the responsibility of someone else, but to the offended, it was costing them something. Now, God tells you and I something about this life, and that is that we are going to face trouble. The Bible says in John 16, 33, in the world ye shall have tribulation. Part of life is there's going to be offense. Part of life is there's going to be stuff that doesn't go your way. This king was owed a lot of money. This servant was owed money by another servant. And Jesus is telling his followers, listen, life is not fair. That's life. Their tribulation is going to come. And Jesus is instructing his followers on how they are to respond when they are wronged. The question this morning is not whether or not you will be wronged. Yes to that question. The question for you and I this morning is, with the Lord's help, how will we respond? What will our response be? 
And God is giving instruction here that these offenses are not to be ignored. We're not to take uh, man's methods of gossip or vengeance or anything of this nature. We're to learn the way of Christ and His method so that we may see restoration. In fact, the Bible teaches us what that is in Matthew 18, verse 15 in your notes. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Boy, if we would just practice that so oftentimes, how little drama we might have. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And so God says, I have a plan for when stuff doesn't go your way, for it to be restored, to be resolved, to be reconciled. But we have to live according to God's plan. So in this story, this parable that we're reading about, you have those who were offended. Money was owed to them, and it was costing them. But then secondly, notice the one who sinned. Now we read in the story of this servant, as the certain king is taking account, that this guy owes me a lot of money. (laughs) And uh, this servant had been delinquent. Uh, in his debt. And then he finds a servant as he leaves the presence of the king uh, who owed him money. And, and he felt so strongly about it, he took him by the throat to reconcile the situation. Now, I submit to you and I this morning, we've all been here. Every one of us in this room are a sinner. We all have done wrong. We all have made mistakes. We all have been on the end of the equation where we were the one causing the wrong or the offense to someone else. The Bible says, For there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I am a sinner. You are a sinner. We all have been here. We all have been in a situation where no doubt we have done something wrong. And the Bible says to you and I in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar... And there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. God says, listen, if you're coming here to worship God and you remember, you know what, I think I did something or said something or was involved in something and I don't think that's right. God says it's on us as a believer who has wronged somebody, to go to them to make it right. And the key word in verse number 24 there, he said, first be reconciled to thy brother. That's God's plan or will, that we would be reconciled. The word reconciled means to bring back together again or to restore. God is a restorative God. God doesn't want strife in the body of Christ. He wants unity and he wants us to come together and to restore and to be back together through reconciliation found through the believer who remembers I did wrong to somebody and goes to that person and says, listen, I'm sorry. Now, what is it about our human nature where we don't like to say the words, I'm sorry? Well, certainly pride. I was witnessing recently, and it was a young child, and it was an innocent situation, but we were going over what the gospel meant, and I said, hey, buddy, have you ever done anything wrong before? And he just looked at me, and and I said, my goodness, this is the first person I've ever met who's never done anything wrong. You've never disobeyed your parents. You, none of this, none of that. And he just never had. I thought, my goodness, I'm living in the presence of perfection right here, you know. And sometimes that's the way we think. And God reminds us, listen, we've all done stuff wrong. And if we know we've wronged somebody, if we know we've said something to our spouse, if we know that we've done something with one of our children or something at work or a neighbor or whatever the case may be, it's on us to reconcile. It's on us to approach them. It's on us to say, hey, I'm sorry. And God has a plan that if we will in humility apologize and in grace if we will forgive, that we indeed can have that reconciliation. And so you have the offended one, you have the one that sinned, but then notice thirdly we have the observing king. Now if this parable was just about these servants squaring things away between themselves, we would miss the most important factor of the entire story. The parable has a third character, and we read of him in verse number 23, where the Bible says that there was a certain king, a certain king. And we know that the first servant goes to the king, or is brought before him rather, 
because he owes them a serious amount of money. And as a plea is given, this is the king who has compassion on that servant and forgives him. But then it's interesting, after he receives such forgiveness in the presence of the certain king, that as he goes and he finds the servant who owes him money, and that servant begins to plea for his forgiveness, we already read it, he doesn't give it to him. Have you ever stopped to think about how his response would be different had the king been with him? Had he left the chambers with the king by his side? And on the way home, coming into contact with this servant who also owed him money, who began to give a plea for patience and forgiveness, what his answer would have been had the king been there. But the king wasn't there. And he doesn't give patience or forgiveness or mercy. And he has the man thrown into prison. And we read that in verse 31 that the king becomes aware of his conduct. Finds out exactly what he did to that fellow servant. And and when his opportunity to show grace and mercy and forgiveness failed, he was brought back before the king and he was judged harshly for it. Now you and I would do well to remember that we serve a king who is always with us. The Bible says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. God is always with us. He knows everything about us. And as we go through life, we have to remember we live in the presence of the King of Kings. We have one who loves us. We have one who has forgiven us. We have one who is with us watching and waiting all of the time. And the game changer for the Christian really in every area of life, but particularly in the area of bestowing forgiveness is the fact that we live in the presence of Almighty God. And when you and I are called upon to do something that maybe our flesh resists, but we know it is right, we must remember that God is there. In fact, the reason that you and I can forgive, and quite frankly should forgive, is because He has forgiven us. And He is with us, and He will help us along the way. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 32, and be a kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Did you notice in the passage that we read the verbiage of the two servants? The servant before the king is, it is read to him his debt. In verse number 26, we read that that servant falls down and worships the king saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will repay thee all. Have mercy. But then as he leaves forgiven, he finds a servant who owes him but a hundred pence. And notice what that servant says to him in verse 29. That fellow servant falls down at his feet and besought him saying, Have patience with me and I will pay thee all. You say, Brother Gabe, that sounds familiar. It is. It's exactly what the first guy said. The first servant's plea to the king and the second servant's plea to him was the same. Have patience, and I will pay thee all. You know what that reminds you and I of this morning? There's really no difference between you and I receiving the forgiveness of God and giving forgiveness to other people. It's amazing in our human nature and the way our mind thinks that somehow we kind of deserve God's forgiveness. But when it comes to all the people that done us wrong, No way. But the truth of the matter is, it was the same. What the first servant had received from the king was exactly what the second servant was asking for. What he had just been given is exactly what the second servant desired. You know what the difference was? Was in the amount of money they owed. That was the significant difference. Now, this first servant who owed the king some money, I don't know how he rang up such a bill, but it was a whopper. Notice it in our passage in verse number 25, or verse 24, excuse me. And when he began to reckon, one was brought in him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now, the talent was the highest known denomination of currency in the ancient Roman Empire. So as high as it could go, that's what it was. And then 10,000 was the highest number for which the Greek language had a particular word. So the highest denomination 
at the highest amount, the capacity thereof, as could be recorded, that was this man's debt. He owed a great sum of money. Now, if you try to equivalent it to today, and it's hard to do, most theologians estimate that it is 10 million plus. Some said over 100. It's a lot of money, more than I probably could comprehend. That was the debt he owed the king. And amazingly, the king, out of compassion, forgives him for that debt. Then he leaves and he runs into his fellow servant. And we read in verse number 28 that that servant found the fellow servant which owed him a hundred pence. Now the pence, or denarii, was a Roman penny. It was equivalent of one day's wage. And so in modern day terms, you have several million versus a few dollars. That was the difference. The king had forgiven this first servant of a ransom. But the, sec the first servant refused to forgive the second servant of a much smaller offense. And certainly the lesson here is simple. We will never be asked to forgive someone for more than God has already forgiven us. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. If I got what I deserved, then I would spend an eternity away from God in a place called hell because of my sin, and you would be in the same boat. But God in his love, not wanting us to be separated from him, sends his son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life on Calvary, not having to, but choosing to, because Jesus Christ was perfect. And he died on the cross and was buried and rose again from the dead. And he provides an alternative payment for our sin. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And when you and I ask God to be our Savior and to forgive our sins and to take us to heaven someday, God freely gives that. And forgiveness of our sins is applied. In fact, the Bible says that as a believer, if you've placed your faith and trust in Christ, that when you stand before God someday, he will see you as the righteousness of the only begotten Son of God. Now, my, my mind has a hard time even comprehending that. How could God ever look at me and see Jesus? I don't know, because I know me. And when I look at me, I don't see Jesus. When my wife looks at me, she doesn't see Jesus. <laughs> she should. And I'm working on it, but sometimes it's not there like it should be. But God, that's what he sees because of his love and because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and his resurrection and his forgiveness. So I have been given way more than I will ever deserve. And then as I go through life, God says, hey, rule, you're going to face stuff that you don't like. People are going to do and say things that aren't fair. It's life, it happens, but you should forgive. And you should forgive, very simply, because I forgave you. The debt that was cleared for the first servant was reason enough that when that second servant pleaded for patience until he could pay all, it should have been, you are forgiven. So these are the participants. Now, secondly, let's notice in our study this morning, the principles. There's some great principles in Matthew 18 as it pertains to forgiveness. And I want us to extract them out of this parable this morning and do our best to apply them to our life. First of all, notice that forgiveness is preceded by repentance. How was this first servant forgiven for such a ransom? Well, it's amazing when he is brought before the king and the king begins to talk about what he owes and begins to say that he should be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had until payment could be made. I mean, this guy is sweating bullets. He's about to spend the rest of his life in prison with his wife and his children. And he begins to think about that fate. And so he falls down. He worships the king and he says to the king, uh, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. The man did not begin to argue with the king about what he owed. Immediately his response was on the ground, worship, plead for mercy. You and I must understand this morning that forgiveness is preceded by repentance. There has to be on our behalf a humble spirit a willingness to acknowledge that we've done something wrong and then a desire to seek 
forgiveness. And once repentance has occurred, then forgiveness is required. The Bible says in Luke's account, chapter 17 and verse 3, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Boy, once somebody truly repents, then forgiveness is required. And for you and I that know Christ this morning, if somebody is seeking our forgiveness and they've repented of wrong, we don't have a leg to stand on not to forgive. And this morning, for every one of us, there must be a time in our life where we have repented to the Lord Jesus Christ, where we have admitted we have done wrong, where we recognize we don't want to pay the debt associated with that and where we have received Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and we now live forgiven by Him. So forgiveness is preceded by repentance. But then notice letter B, that forgiveness sometimes requires repeating. Sometimes it's got to be repeated in the matter. The Bible says in Luke 17, 4, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day turn again to thee saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Now, God has challenged us to go against our nature and our own thinking, and both in Matthew and in Luke has said repeatedly, forgive. And I know this is how it works, because Jesus Christ has repeatedly forgiven me. Is anyone else in this room guilty of asking Jesus Christ more than once forgiveness in one particular area? Now, all those who didn't raise their hand, there's going to be a very special service for you right after the service. No, I'm teasing. And uh, there might be, but I don't think so. I don't think we're going to have time. Every one of us in this room at one time or another have had to ask Jesus Christ forgiveness for something that surely one other time before we've asked him forgiveness for. And we know that Jesus Christ forgives over and over and over again. And you and I should have that same disposition as Jesus Christ lives in us and as we have the Spirit of God filling us that we would be willing to forgive repeatedly to whoever it may be for whatever reason. That is the response of a child of God. Forgiveness sometimes requires repeating. But then notice, let us see that forgiveness is permanent. Forgiveness is permanent. Now, I love the word pictures in the Bible of God's forgiveness. I love it. And I've given them to you in your notes. But the Bible says that there are four illustrations of God's forgiveness. The Bible says that God takes our sin and he buries them in the depths of the sea. Way down there where there's no light, where uh, nobody is, the Bible says that's where he buries our sin. The Bible says in Psalms 103 that as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. God says, I have buried your sins in the depths of the sea. God says, I've put them as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says in Isaiah that they shall be white as snow. And then God says in Hebrews that their sins and iniquities will I remember no no more. Boy, when God forgives, he takes that sin debt, depths of the sea, east from the west, white as snow. He promises to remember it no more. Wow. That's forgiveness. Now, wouldn't it be great to forgive like God? And yet sometimes in our finite thinking, we don't forget stuff. We forgive we say the right thing, but sure enough, you let that person do one other thing, and it's like, without even thinking, immediately, if we wanted to, we could articulate every mistake they've made for the last seven years. I mean, just down to what they wore, I mean, everything. It's incredible what our minds can recollect. And while we may struggle to truly forget it permanently, with God's help, we can live as if we have forgotten because true forgiveness is permanent. I love what the Bible says of the king in verse number 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. Isn't that amazing? This servant who owed him this ransom and his feet pleading moved on the heart of that king. And when it moved on the heart of the king, the Bible says, and loosed him and forgave the debt. Isn't that an amazing phrase? And loosed him. No strings attached. Nothing else to put over his head. Loosed. Forgiven. Forgotten. The bill, the 10,000 talents, 
forgiven. Shred it. Doesn't exist. Never happened. Loosed. And that's the forgiveness that God wants you and I to give. Jay Adams, a counselor and author, said forgiveness is a promise. It's a promise that we will not bring up the offense again. Once it's been repented and once it's been forgiven, we're not to bring it up to the person who did us wrong. We're not to tell others about it, but most importantly, we're not to tell ourselves about it. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can rehearse what people have done to us. And it can really get us going. Could you imagine going to the prayer closet tomorrow morning and God just be fuming mad? And you begin to commune with the Heavenly Father. Or you can just sense something not right. And in your own way, you say, God, what's wrong? And then God just unloads on you the last five years of sin. How would you feel tomorrow going to work? I think that would be a pretty miserable experience. But if we're not careful, that's how we treat each other. If we're not careful, we can begin to articulate to somebody who has hurt us with almost a poisonous venom all that they have done. And God was teaching his followers, you can't do that. Forgiveness needs to be permanent. His two little brothers, Harry and James, and they had finished supper. They were up in their rooms playing, and they were doing what all boys do and kind of roughhousing and so on. And sure enough, I don't know how it happened, but Harry hit James in the head with a toy. Well, James started crying and screaming, and, and uh, Harry was trying to kind of cover it up, you know. And sure enough, Mom came up the stairs, and she had come into the room, and she was trying to kind of calm things down. And the boys were arguing and yelling and calling each other names, and Mom was trying to get them to bed. And finally, the mom said, now, boys... Wouldn't it be terrible if one of you died in the night and you weren't living forgiven? And Harry said, okay, Mom, I'll forgive James. But I want you to know this. If we're both still alive in the morning, he's going to get what's coming to him. <laughs> and you know what? That's sometimes how we live. <laughs> you know, right now I'm going to do the right thing because it's what I'm supposed to do. But I'll get even some point. And God says, no, it's to be permanent. And notice letter D, that forgiveness is unmerited. Jesus forgave us not because we earned it. Jesus forgave us because he earned it. And we are called on to live as Christ will live. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 10 8, Freely ye have received, freely give. That certain king did not forgive the servant because he brought the ransom back as payment. He forgave him out of compassion. The Bible says in Colossians 3.13, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Well, they don't deserve my forgiveness. You don't know what they've done to me. You don't know how I've suffered. You don't know what they said. You don't understand the situation. And I'm not making little of it. I'm not demeaning of it. And I don't know the situation. But here's what I know. The forgiveness that I have received of God. I didn't earn that. I didn't deserve it. In fact, I deserve the exact opposite of that. But God in his love, mercy and grace gave and as you and I receive Christ and we walk with him, God says one of the marks that you're my child is that when you give forgiveness, it's unmerited. It's just by grace. It's not because of what that person has done. It's because of what God is doing in you. Forgiveness is unmerited. Then we see next that forgiveness prohibits vengeance. It prohibits vengeance. In fact, in not seeking vengeance, Jesus certainly is the chief example. The Bible says of him in 1 Peter 2, 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Jesus Christ was not giving, getting even. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And forgiveness prohibits you and I from a vengeful kind of attitude. A, a I've got to reckon things and I've got to make sure things are fair and right and I've got to get back at them and, and they need this for me. Listen, leave that in God's court. Just forgive. And forgiveness prohibits you from a spirit of vengeance. 
Our family altar time in our home is called special times. Usually four or five nights a week we have special times and I will say to uh, our uh, children uh, a few minutes before bedtime, hey, it's special times, and they'll run into the living room and they'll sit around me on the couch and we'll, we'll do what we've learned uh, for family altar. Well, years ago, I used what was called the picture Bible. Our kids were very young. And the picture Bible is about 275 stories from the Word of God put in kind of a pictorial form. It just helps the kids to understand the Word of God and for the Word of God to come to life. And so we were reading right through that in our family devotions. And in this particular particular night we had come to some stories from the book of 2 Samuel and this particular night we read about some battles and in one particular battle Abner uh, a man in 2 Samuel of war had killed Asahel now Asahel was Joab Joab was King David's general Asahel was Joab's brother so Abner killed Asahel in battle. Now, Abner didn't want to. He kept telling Asahel to leave him alone. Asahel kept pursuing Abner. Finally, Abner killed Asahel. Well, a few days later, King David calls Abner to a meeting with him. Joab is King David's general. Joab comes into town and hears from his men, hey, David just met with Abner, the guy that killed your brother. And Joab is ticked. He wants to know why King David met with the man who killed his brother. Well, Joab goes after Abner, calls him back into the city, kind of goes off to the side for the main gate. They have a conversation. And in that moment, Joab kills Abner. Takes the life of the man who killed his brother. Gets even, if you will. Well, we're reading all through this in the picture Bible and family special times. And finally, our kids kind of look up at me and say, Dad, was God okay with that? I mean, Joab just killed Abner. Great questions these little theologians have, you know. And uh, so we talked about, you know, God's word teaches us we're not to murder and we're to value life. But then we also taught the fact that the Bible teaches that if a man takes a life, his life should be taken. Capital punishment. And we began to talk about how that worked. And you could just see the wheels in their minds turning, you know. And I think it was Mariah. Mariah looked at me and she said, Dad, then if Lydia ever kills me, who's going to kill Lydia? <laughs> and Lydia said, now, Dad, if Joseph kills me, who's going to kill him? And all of our kids wanted to know that if any of their siblings murdered them, whose job in the family was it to take their life so everything was going to be okay? I mean, we, we lost the evening. Uh, uh, we... Uh, we, we had to get back on track the following night. And, and, and their little minds were trying to conceive how does all this work and how can it be even? You know what in life? It's not going to be. It's not going to be. But can I submit to you something? The minute we hear that, our mind thinks, that's right. It's not going to be. I've got it so bad. You know what? It's not going to be even because I'm getting more good than I deserve. It's not going to be even. But when I forgive, it prohibits me from vengeance. It prevents me from living on a war path of making life even. Because that's an endless journey. Because it's not going to be even. And if we would just stop to recognize, God, you have given me so much. Help me just to forgive and to prevent that kind of living. Because letter F, forgiveness prevents bitterness. Forgiveness prevents bitterness. Now, it's been said that bitterness destroys the container that holds it. And most of us could think of examples of those we know that have fell victim to this tragic mistake of becoming so bitter inwardly. And the Lord, the Lord warns in Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligent, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. I love the quote, bitterness is the poison we swallow in our effort to harm the one who wronged us. The world's worst prison cell is the prison of an unforgiving heart. Forgiveness prevents bitterness. The king loosed him. You know how much sleep the king lost about that small ransom after that moment? None. You know how much that king thought about those 10,000 talents and what he could have done with all that money? None. He loosed him. When that meeting was over, the debt was gone. 
It did not affect the king for the rest of his life. That's exactly how God wants you and I to live. Yes, we're going to face trials and tribulation. Yes, we're going to face hard times. Yes, stuff's going to happen to us. It isn't fair and it isn't right. But God wants us to loose them, to forgive them, and to prevent bitterness from taking root in our heart. The principles of forgiveness. But notice as we close, the priority of forgiveness. Now, how important does God consider our willingness to forgive? How does God want us to react to these moments in our life? Well, we notice in verse number 33, 34 and 35, as the king now comes back into contact with this servant whom he forgave, who refused to forgive the fellow servant. Boy, there's a day of reckoning about to happen here. And we learn from this the priority of forgiveness. There's two real priorities at play in this warning. First of all, letter A, the priority of compassion. The priority of compassion. Compassion is a great characteristic of the heart of God. When you and I exercise compassion through forgiveness, we are being most like God. We are never more like God than when we forgive. The Bible says in Psalms 145, 8, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Psalm 86, 5, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Did you notice the description of God there in Psalm 86, 5? God, you are good. You are ready to forgive. That's the default position of God. God reigning in heaven stands, default position, ready to forgive. And as the prayers of his people come up, asking and confessing and asking for forgiveness, God says, I forgive, 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 I forgive. It's his default position. You know what God wants you and I to have? Default position of forgiveness. When stuff happens in life and people say, I'm sorry, we say, hey, no problem. Hey, I forgive you. Hey, we're good. Just default. Not have to think it through, not weigh the options, not I don't know. Just default. I forgive. The priority of compassion. Living ready to forgive. Jesus lived this characteristic. At every turn of his earthly ministry, he lived ready to forgive. He showed compassion on tax collectors, the diseased and unwanted, those found and caught in sin, the hurting and the masses. The Bible says when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. For those in this room that we might be too proud to forgive or too bitter to forgive or too wounded to forgive, I believe Jesus Christ asked you and I the same question. He asked the servant in verse number 33 where he said, Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? The priority of compassion. Should not that be your default position because of what God has given to you? And then the priority of obedience. We see in verse number 34, And his Lord was wroth. Could you imagine that, king? forgave that servant of that ransom only to hear that he goes and grabs a guy by the throat for a couple of bucks. Boy, he comes back before the king and his Lord was wroth, verse 34, and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due to him. So likewise, shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Interesting language the Bible uses. Clear to tell us everyone. We can't reserve just a few to hold grudges to. God says we are to forgive everyone. This morning, can I submit to you and I the simple fact that forgiveness is a command. And a command presents a choice. We either choose to obey or disobey. Now, God is never going to instruct you and I to do what he will not enable you and I to do. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And God will help you and I to forgive. Dennis Rainey said, It may take a while for your feelings to catch up with your will, but your will needs to respond to the scriptural mandate to forgive. 
When you and I withhold forgiveness from others, it places us in direct disobedience to our Heavenly Father. And by extension, it places us under His correction and chastisement because we are in disobedience. In fact, the Bible so powerfully puts it in Matthew chapter 6, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, verse 15, if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. R.T. Kendall said, as a Christian, we have no choice. Either we forfeit our fellowship with God and blessings here below when we do not forgive or we forgive. What will we do with the choice to forgive? So can I challenge us this morning? Let's take inventory. Is there someone that we have wronged that we need to go to and say we're sorry? Is there someone who has wronged us that we need to confront for the purpose of reconciliation? Is there someone who has wronged us who has already asked us for forgiveness, but we unbiblically are withholding it and we need to freely give it? Or has there never been a time where we have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and therefore do not know what it means to live forgiven? Whatever it is that we need to do this morning, it is my prayer that we will respond as the Lord Jesus Christ calls his followers here and says, Guys, i got to teach you something. I'm about to go. And you're going to be here ministering to people. And if you're going to do that well, you've got to know how to forgive. I think God says to us as a church family this morning, Lancaster Baptist, if you're going to make a difference in this community and in your homes, you're going to have to know how to forgive. So let's learn from this parable and apply these truths to our life and help. ask God to help us. Lord, help me as a default to forgive. And may I never forget that I can live forgiven because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross on Mount Calvary. Dear Heavenly Father, we sure love you.